I'm going to start talking now about homomorphisms between groups. So remember that a homomorphism F is a map from a group G to a group H, satisfying some conditions, namely that F of G1, G2 equals F of G1 times F of G2 for all G1, G2 and G, and F of the identity equals the identity. So in other words, F is a map that intertwines the group multiplication on G and on H. So homomorphisms play a key role in group theory that you'll have seen already. We're going to focus on the case where G and H are matrix groups. Let me just give you a quick example. The determinant gives us a homomorphism from GLNR to GL1R. Namely, the matrix A goes to the one by one matrix DET A. That's one way of thinking about the determinant. And the fact that this is a homomorphism is saying two things. It's saying DET of A1A2 equals DET of A1 times DET of A2, which is a nice formula that you hopefully saw in a linear algebra course earlier in your life. And it's also saying that DET of the identity matrix is 1. Now this is a course in which we are aiming to use the tools from calculus to prove as much as we can about groups and homomorphisms between them. So we'd like to be able to differentiate F. What do I actually mean? Right, how can you differentiate a map between groups? Maybe you know how to differentiate a function. Maybe you even know how to differentiate a map from Rn to Rm by just taking partial derivatives of components of the map. But G and H are some weird groups, right? How do we differentiate a map between groups? Well, we have local coordinates on our groups, um, these exponential charts. So we define um, a homomorphism F of matrix groups to be smooth or differentiable. So smooth means infinitely differentiable, so I'll just usually say smooth. Um, if it is smooth, as in infinitely differentiable, when written in local exponential charts. What does this mean? Well, here's our Lie algebra little g. It's got an exponential map to big G. Here's the Lie algebra little h. It's got a map, exponential map to big H. Here's our homomorphism f from big H to big, uh, sorry, big G to big H. We would like to get a map little f from little g to little h because little g is a vector space, little h is a vector space, so we might as well think of them as Rn and Rm. And then a map from Rn to Rm is something we can differentiate because we just take the partial derivatives of the components of that map. Um, so we know what it means for little f if it exists to be infinitely differentiable, smooth. So how do we get a map like this? Well, you just follow the arrows in the diagram. You go down along exp, you go forward along f, and then you go backwards along exp. In other words, you use the logarithm from h to little h. And unfortunately, that doesn't work, right? Because the logarithm isn't defined on the whole of h. But nonetheless, let's, let's define the function little f to be log composed with f composed with exp wherever this makes sense. So it's a partially defined function. In other words, it's defined on a small neighborhood of the zero matrix in little g. So on the neighborhood of the zero matrix in little g. 
note that by this definition, uh, there's a nice formula. F of X, X, that is big F of X, X, is X of little f of X, just by taking X of both sides in this formula. This is for all X in a suitable neighborhood of the zero matrix in G, not necessarily for all X. But the remarkable theorem is that if F G to H is a smooth homomorphism of matrix groups, then first of all, this little f is a linear map. In other words, it's the restriction of a linear map to a neighborhood of the zero matrix. That's a drastic simplification. Linear maps you can describe just by writing down a matrix. So that's a lot simpler than writing down a homomorphism. Um, because it's linear, what that means is it's the restriction of a linear map, which I'm going to call f star from little g to little h to a neighborhood of the identity, oh, sorry, a neighborhood of the zero matrix. So big f star is going to denote the linear map from g to h, little g to little h, that gives us little f when we restrict to this neighborhood. Um, Remarkable fact, this formula that I told you, um, f of x x equals x of now f star x holds for all x in G. Right, so if I just use little f here, I have to say this holds for all x in a neighborhood of the zero matrix. But if I use big F, at least the formula makes sense for all x in, G, in little g. And it turns out it's true for all x in little g. Third, um, this map f star, linear map from little g to little h, preserves the Lie bracket in the sense that f, uh, f star of x bracket y equals bracket of f star x with f star y. So you put a word here and the word should be satisfies. This third condition is not unexpected because we obtained f star, basically if you look at the equation in two, we obtain f star by taking f inside the exponential. And remember the baker campbell hausdorff formula told us that x of a times x of b is x of something involving the Lie bracket. So if f preserves the group product of x a and x b, then f star should preserve the Lie bracket inside the x. That's the, that's the feeling you should have. Um, that's why number three is true. We'll, we'll see a proof. So just to illustrate the awesomeness of this theorem, I want to explain what it means for this example that we mentioned to begin with, namely debt. What it's saying is there is a linear map um, which I'm going to call debt star from little g l n r to little g l 1 r because I was thinking of debt as a map from big GLN to big GL1, such that um, debt of X A equals E to the uh, debt star A for all matrices A. 
So debt star A is a very simple map. It turns out that debt star A is just the trace of A. In other words, it's A11 plus A22 plus dot 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 plus ANN. It's the sum of the diagonal entries of A. So this is extremely cool. This formula is saying debt of X A is E to the trace of A. So X of A is something hard to compute, you know, hard to understand. Debt is another thing that's got a big ugly formula. But trace is something really, really simple. You just add the diagonal entries of your matrix. So I think this is a fantastic formula. Um, let's just define why it's the trace. Well, by the theorem that we haven't yet proved and we'll prove in a later video, um, this debt star is a linear map. So it's sufficient to compute it on a basis to understand what it is. So debt star is linear. So it's determined by its value on a basis of little glnr. So I'm just going to use the stupidest basis you can think of. Um, I'm going to take one zero zero dot 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 zero zero. In other words, the matrix where the only non-zero entry is in the one one position. The matrix where the only non-zero entry is in the one two position, etc. The matrix where the only non-zero entry is in the one three position, all the way down to where the only non-zero entry is in the bottom right. Okay, so that's a basis for the set of matrices. It's that one varies over all the possible positions. Um, so let's see. We need to check that this formula holds for each of these matrices and then we'll know that this is the right thing to put there. So debt of exp of something where it has a one on the diagonal and zeros elsewhere. Let's check it in that case first. That is debt of the identity plus this matrix plus a half times this matrix squared dot dot dot. So the next one is one over three factorial, etc. So in other words, we get debt of the matrix with ones everywhere on the diagonal except in this single position where we get one plus one plus a half plus a one over three factorial etc which is exactly what you get by doing e to the one you know, substituting one into the um, Taylor series for e so that determinant is e which is e to the one and that is e to the trace of this matrix that just had a one somewhere in the diagonal Okay, so the formula works there, and it also works, I claim, when we have a one somewhere on the off diagonal and zeros elsewhere. And that I will leave as an exercise. This should be equal to um, e to the trace of this matrix. So this theorem is what we're going to prove um, next.